So Catherine, over to you. Fantastic. Thanks, Elise. And nice to see everybody. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, present to you today. Um, as Elise said, um, please make any notes of any questions throughout the, the presentation and we can deal with them at the end. I think we just found in past years it was easier to do that than uh, do it throughout the course when we're all online. So, oops. Come on. So um, as Ali said, I'm partner at Evaluate Consulting. We have started a company about eight years ago now, really to look at health, um, social services, mainly education with the aim of, really with the aim of trying to help guide governments to evaluate programs better, spend our taxpayer money better, um, and actually get better outcomes for people in need and um, in experiencing disadvantage. My background's in merchant banking. I was a political staffer. I worked for a global pharmaceutical company um, and at Medibank Private, heading up really government affairs, policy, regulatory areas and communication for a long time. Um, I've got a Bachelor in Economics and one in Theology. Um, I also um, do a lot of volunteer work in the social services area, um, Marriott Support Services, where we are a disability support and employment um, organisation. I used to sit on the board of Victoria Legal Aid and Melbourne City Mission. So really my background and history is really in the policy, strat strategic, political advice and healthcare and economics. So in terms of what I'm going to take you through today, um, for anybody who was online last year or even the year before, I am actually going to follow the the, the same sort of outline, um, partly because of the fact that it's logical, partly because really reading budget papers while papers change, you just the same process is quite useful. So I'll take you through a bit of the context for this year's budget, what the budget process looks like, what's in one, um, how to approach one, and you'll see this often, and I will say it several times today. So um, prepare well. It's one of the reasons we run this session a couple of weeks before the budget, so you have time to prepare, look at, at various documents and sources, and really get yourself ready for budget night. Um, the budget, looking at what's in it, um, the structure of the budget papers, how to read the budget papers, what are some of the challenges or pitfalls, and there are a couple that are particularly present in New South Wales, I think, this year, um, and how to check your information. So when you actually have read them, you think you know what you're, you're seeing, how can you actually check you're right? So this year's budget, budget 2024-25, is this government's second budget. So last year we kind of had their first term budget, which as per usual was all about sort of fixing the other guy's problems and the mistakes. There was a lot of talk about budget repair, sustainability, moderating economic, how do you, do you deal with moderate economic growth, cost of living, high inflation, and a lot of discussions last year about the former government leading leaving unfunded priorities and unfunded programs, including nurse salaries and all sorts of things. This year, we, you know, it's a second budget. We're seeing the return to a normal budget timetable following an election. We're still seeing those ongoing economic challenges really inform um, this this budget. There's a lot of cost of living pressures, which everybody's only too well aware of, particularly in the sort of sectors you all work in and I work in significant ongoing concern, particularly in sort of Sydney, metropolitan Sydney, about employment and ongoing debt. Um, and on top of that, New South Wales has had a very unfavourable GST carve up in terms of what you're getting in, in compared to other states. And the Treasurer has been talking about this quite a lot. Um, there's a concern about the state's AAA credit rating. Um, and of course, if you, you lose that, it just means you pay more um, interest on your debt. Uh, your borrowings and your debt. At the same time, I live in Victoria. I'm on Wurundjeri country today. And I'd just like to say that, you know, I do look at your uh, state government with a degree of uh, envy. You're, you're certainly economically in a much better position than we are. So what is a budget? So a budget is actually really just the way the mechanism, the legal and other mechanism by which governments appropriate money or raise funds, essentially. Um, it is the most important annual political, economic, social document that a government um, writes or provides. It tells you about what's happening both in the year that's coming, 
but also the following three years. So that's called the forward estimate. So this year deals with 24, 25, and then the following three years, so 25, 26, 26, 27, and 27, 28, are referred to as the, the, the forward estimates. And they're also captured in this year's budget papers. Fundamentally, though, what a budget does is it tells you what the government thinks is happening in the economy. It tells you what services they're planning to provide, what performances they're going to track, what they think is important, and how they're spending your money. The budget cycle starts a long time before the budget actually is brought down. So the budget, your budget's being brought down this year on the 18th of June. The budget cycle starts way back in December. Uh, and people start internal to government, cabinet ministers, departmental secretaries, and everybody start looking at what, what are their priorities for the next year? What do they really want to spend money on? How much money do they think there's going to be? What are the government's you know, priorities? So they have a senior minister's review. Then every department writes a budget submission. I know many of you will also have written um, budget submissions to the Treasury and to your, your portfolio departments, but every government department also writes a portfolio budget statement or submission saying, this is what we want to do, this is the money we want to spend. Um, some of them are even very decent sometimes and say, actually, and here are some programs we don't need to run anymore, although that's less and less common. Um, you have the Expenditure Review cap, um, Committee, so that's a, a group of Cabinet Ministers who sit down and go through in great detail over a series of weeks, weekends, late nights and so forth, all of the budget portfolio submissions, work out what, what they're going to do. You then have the budget cabinet, which would happen around you now, maybe you should probably has happened by now, might not have done. Um, it just depends on how strongly people are arguing things, where the cabinet, the government's cabinet actually signs off on the budget. You then have the budget, you looked at then any legislation that's involved in passing the budget. So you actually have to make legislation um they will be passed hopefully by the 30th of june and then you have a process following the budget so the budget kind of runs all year where you have budget estimates where you know government committees ask treasury and other bureaucrats what they're spending money on how are the programs going what the actual deliverables are you then get annual reports in november and then in december you have a half yearly review of where the budget's at. So this just is a cycle that just continues and there are groups within departments and in, in Treasury who work on this process all the year round. And it really is a bit of a parallel process. So you actually have three processes going at once. You have the post budget, so that's the reporting against last year's budget, so the 2023 budget. You have this year's budget, so 2024, 25, and then you actually are starting already, you know, pretty much within three months of this budget go being being dealt with and being signed off, you'll actually then have the priorities being looked at for next year's budget as well. So you can't actually read budgets in isolation in a way. You actually do need to have a sense or go back and have a look at what's happened before and what plans are happening in advance because of that cycle that I just showed you. So in terms of what's in the budget, they really are statements of intent about expenditure and revenue raising. So basically, it's, it's not dissimilar if you run a household budget of this is how much we think we're going to get this year, and this is what we're planning to spend it on. Traditionally, New South Wales reported against what they called state outcomes, which were basically performance measures. Last year, the new government, un relatively unsurprisingly, decided to get rid of those and started to transition to a broader range of wellbeing and performance measures. And I'll talk about those quite a bit in this process, in, in today's presentation. The first piece of the wellbeing and performance measures are going to be issued this year on the 18th of, of, of June as part of the budget papers, but they are actually going to review them over the year. So they might not be quite the same as next, same next year, and they're not the same as last year. Um, as I said, I'll come back to that. There's a whole series of policy statements. There are the, the actual accounts that relate to the policy statements. And then there's a lot of information about what the assumptions of the, the government have been. And you might have read some of that in relation to the federal government's budget when there was a lot of discussion about what Treasury and the, the, the government thought inflation was going to be versus what the Reserve Bank of Australia thought um, inflation might be. 
So interest rates, debt repayments, growth, income and tax, employment, all of those things are included in the budget because that relates to how much revenue you might be raising, but it also relates to how much expenditure you have, to, how much money you've got to spend. So in terms of approaching a budget, you know, prepare well. You know, we're going to look at these ideas about, you know, what's your purpose of, re of, of reading the budget? What are the areas that you're interested in? Where are those in the budget papers? And how do you work out what happened previously? So really, as I said, I'm going to say prepare well often, but really do sit down and think about these things quite specifically and individually as part of your budget planning. So first of all, work out why you're actually interested in the budget. You probably know this, but actually it's really good to sit down and say, why are you interested? Are you actually going to go and talk to the government and say you haven't spent money in this area? You should have done. We we still think that this is important, and you you need to be you know, committing to that. Are you trying to update your members or other stakeholders? Are you writing a board report? Are you going to tell the board? And are you communicating to the media? So what's what's the purpose of what you're trying to to read the budget paper for? And then what are you going to do with that information? Are you going to be briefing people? Will you be issuing a media release? Are you going to be writing a board paper? If you're doing any of those things, I would really say prepare an outline or a template in advance. So actually on budget night, you're not dealing with formatting your documents. You're not doing any of those types of things. You're actually just filling in information to a brief. You might reorder it and so forth, but you're actually just filling information into a template rather than starting from scratch. It will just save you time. And then what are the areas that you're interested in? You know, homelessness, mental health, disability support, climate change, health, you know, education. What are the areas that you're specifically looking at? So some of you may have many areas that you're looking in in a budget. Some of you may have just a, a fewer number. If you've got a team or you're working with other people and you can call other people on, in to help on budget night, Allocate them to different people. I mean, budget night can be quite a lot of fun working together, um, but it also shares the workload from being just you sort of sitting by yourself, staring at a computer. So if there is that opportunity, I'd encourage you to do that. And where are your issues in the budget papers? And I really would look at this in terms of looking at last year's budgets, you know, which portfolio are your issues in? So you don't waste time looking at the wrong portfolio for information. You can look at last year's budget papers, work out where they were last year, because you know they're probably likely to still be in the same sort of area this year if they, they were there last year. If they are new or you're hoping for something new, where do you think they're going to be? Where do you think, looking at the structure of last year's budget papers, and we'll go through that in a minute, where do you think they'll logically be? Again, it's just really about preparing so you're not wasting time and you're not sort of panicked on budget night going, oh, where is everything? You've actually got an idea and you've got a structure in your thinking already. So look at last year's budget papers. They're a really useful you know, indicator often of how a government's thinking. What did they say also would be spent on your area over the forward estimates? So you know, compare. It's often you sort of have last year's budget paper with you. What's actually said last year, what's said this year? Are there numbers that are different? So did they say they were going to spend 50, 000, 50 million this year and they're now spending 10? Is there any change at all? What sort of announcements have been made since that you can actually track in the budget papers and then see in this year's papers? But actually just have a good idea of that. That can be really helpful. And there's lots of sources of information. Um, you know, I, I confess not to have looked at your newspapers very recently, but, you know, there's always pre-budget announcements and releases. It comes, it's usually a bit later than this. In the next fortnight, you'd probably expect to start seeing things being released. Watch out for them. Keep alerts on them. The budget papers themselves obviously are a really good source of information. The budget speech, so the treasurer's speech, the treasurer's media releases, there are a lot of other documents that are uh, issued at the same time as the the budget papers. So there, are, you know, usually there's one on on Western Sydney. There's usually one on regional New South Wales. So if you're in those areas or concerning those areas, you want to look at those as well. Um, the uh, budget paper last year became a new paper called Gender Equality, 
So that often has a lot of materials in it, particularly in terms of things like domestic violence, um, children's issues, how do we support women? And there are a lot of facts and other materials. And at the end of this presentation, there's a, a group of websites I've just put up for your for your information. But a lot of departments will have their own budget um, website as well as the one for Treasury. So Treasury has one, but a lot of the departments will have their own with all of the fact sheets, the different media releases, um, just telling people what's happened in their portfolio. So do go and look at those other ministers, not just the treasurers, but you know, if you're interested in education, look up the education minister's health, um, the education minister's um, media releases, look up the Department of Health, the Community and Justice, have a look at what, what they're all saying. And the other thing is, you know, media does a great job for us in telling us a lot of what's in the, the the budget papers. Look at the newspapers, have a look at radio and television. Um, it's really helpful. So in terms of the budget papers last year, and I'll take you through these, this year's one, there will be an additional budget paper, but what's in these papers will still be there. Um, so you have budget paper number one, that's really the, the overview of the state's finances over the forward estimates. It's the main budget statement. Um, I'll be very honest, beyond sort of the top line, you know, what are we expecting employment to be? What is inflation going to be? It's full of that type of information, which often doesn't tell you anything about the policy specific areas that you are likely to be interested in. It will tell you whether the state's going in a good direction or a bad direction, how much you know repayment they're going to make on loans and so forth. But it's unlikely to tell you about whether the new homelessness program you're interested in was funded or not. Budget paper number two is the agency financial statements. And that sort of focuses on the performance of government agencies and their financials. Budget paper three last year was the infrastructure statement. So it tells you all of the capital spending on projects and infrastructure. And budget number four last year was actually the appropriations bills. And I'm not a lawyer. And I confess that while I can read legislation, I don't particularly like it. Um, it can be useful, the appropriation bills about what's going into each port portfolio and department. But agents that paper number two with the agency financials can actually, you know, often tell you far more or Tell you, it, tell you it in a way that's easier to access it at least. So there will be changes this year with the performance and wellness framework. So I'll talk through that as well. As I said, so I, you know, budget papers one to four, the numbers of those budget papers this year might change, but the contents don't. You know, all of that information has to be captured. It's almost always captured in that structure. Um, it's quite hard to change the structure of those four papers. The one that will change this year is there's going there will be a new performance and well-being statement, and that replaces the old outcome statement that the former government used to 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 uh, publish. This is really about moving the New South Wales government reporting to being more about um, what the priorities are, but actually capturing well-being considerations. You may have seen various governments around the world have done this in the last. Um, few years, um, New Zealand being very famous in terms of, you know, producing a well-being budget, you know, the various of the Scandinavian countries do the same. And really, it's about trying to capture well-being considerations into the budget to actually drive better resource allocation in terms of driving better communities. Um, the idea is that it will improve transparency and efficiency, it links the government's objectives with results and ideally with impact. So that's quite hard, but that's the intent. Um, and it will highlight priorities, you know, and I'd expect it to really look at some of the health, education, housing and transport issues. It also brings New South Wales into line with some of the other states and territories in reflecting the, the Commonwealth Government's Measuring What Matters paper. So I suspect I'll be, I'm being slightly cynical here, I suspect it's not going to be hugely that much different from the old outcome statement. I'm hoping it will record more of that impact piece that I just mentioned, but I think it will be quite similar in terms of what its intent or it's trying to do. Its structure will be somewhat different and there will be new performance measures, new wellbeing measures, um, and that is going to be one of the challenges, I think, of this year's budget that you need to be aware of in advance that there will be this new paper. So as I said, though, just going back to you know, taking you through the other papers, 
Budget paper number one is the budget statement. It will tell you what the government's plan is, the top end outlook, the overview of the economic environment, what assumptions and risks they see. So, you know, where is inflation headed? You, you can see this, um, this graph. They're the sorts of things that you often see in the budget paper number one of here's the range and this is what we've made the assumption of this. It'll tell you the top line revenue measures, you know, how much money is coming from your know, stamp duty, land tax, you know, all of those areas. And it's got the consolidated expense revenue and balance sheet measures, which also importantly include new funding. So it also gives you an overview of the forward estimates. So those three years this year and the three years coming. Budget number two focuses on the state government agencies. So they're the bodies that undertake state government activities, departments you know, and other organisations that sit underneath them. It also importantly describes machinery of government changes. So that's when you take an agency or something that's in one department and you move it into another one. So last year, the Office of Sport moved into community and justice, whereas before I think it had been in tourism and jobs. Um, some, so you do actually want to have a look at those pieces. It's right at the very front of the um, paper. If you are looking for something and it's not where you think it, is, it should be or it's not where it was last year, it is worth looking at that machinery of government changes just to see if somebody's moved it within the government. Um, for example, federally, a couple of years ago, they moved a group of people who were responsible for overseeing what doctors do with Medicare. They moved it from the Department of Health over into Services Australia. So it moved from the Department of Health to social services and everybody kind of wondered for you know, literally about few about half an hour at the beginning of the process, where had it gone? Um, so just looking about what that means in terms of something like communities and justice, communities and justice has, you know, obviously the department, it then has 12 agencies. So it's got legal aid, it's got, you know, state emergency service, um, it's got fire and rescue. That all sits as one of the agencies under um, communities and communities and justice. And it then has special offices like the office of the, the DPTP. So they are all grouped together within budget paper number two. All of those agencies are grouped together. So every, all of the material and information about what they're spending, you know, if they're planning on employing more people, what projects are starting, stopping and so forth, are captured all within that community and justice part of paper number two. Paper number three is the infrastructure statement. And I really raise this one. I mean, I always mention it, but you know, it's quite important, I think, at the moment when we're talking about what new, what state governments are doing about how, housing and homelessness. Basically, essential infrastructure plan is in this document. It's telling you what the government's going to invest capital money in next year. You know, hospitals, health, schools, education, transport and energy. And it also links infrastructure to other priorities. So you can actually see government says in one place that it actually wants to spend money, it, it values homelessness. This is where some of that money, if they're going to build a house, will be captured. It's quite useful in the fact that it actually reflects commencing and continuing projects. So it's quite specific about saying this is continuing, this is new. Um, it doesn't actually say stopped projects, but you can assume that if it's not commencing or continuing, they are looking to stop. Um, and there's quite a lot of information about regional programs in there. And it also identifies where the money is coming from that they're planning on spending. Um, so budget paper unknown, I suspect they might make it budget paper number two. It's the performance and wellbeing statement. So Treasury has said that they have drafted an initial set of indicators by which they are going to judge performance and wellbeing in New South Wales. They're planning on expanding it next year, but this year's set of indicators are going to show you what they value, how they're going to group things, and then there'll be a consultation process. So you might have views on this and you might want to give them feedback about how that will look. It's highly likely to be organised in the themes that they've already said that they are interested in. So I would expect it to be essential services, health, education, transport and rebuilding communities, then cost of living support. I think that focus of the New South Wales government will continue this year. So housing, energy, caring for children, stronger and fairer communities. 
And then within each of those themes, they'll outline, I expect they'll outline programs within those outcomes, financial information, what the success measures are going to be, so how they're going to actually measure whether they got the impact they wanted, and performance data. So as I said, there's a little bit of an assumption in there, and it does make this paper somewhat more difficult this year because it's going to be the first time you've seen it, but hopefully it will also lead to greater consistency going forward. But this is how I'd expect it to look, just based on how governments report um, in budget papers. This is the OECD wellbeing framework, and I've just really put this up. It, you, know, you might want to have a look at it um, offline. Um, most governments who are members of the OECD do look at these things when they're looking at a wellbeing framework. So you can see there's a raft of key dimensions and measures that they're looking at. And then there's some things that they'll look at in terms of human capital, social capital, economic capital going forward, and then how you measure those. Um, I really just put this up as an example. There is likely to be a framework that the New South Wales government will put at the very front of, of budget paper, question mark, question mark, which actually outlines their equivalent of this. Um, so that would be worth something I'd look at so that you understand the framework that they are trying to use to measure wellbeing and performance in, in, in New South Wales going forward. And again, make sure that you have the opportunity to uh, you know, comment on it as they, as they develop it further for next year's budget. So in terms of reading the budget papers, review the budget speech. The budget speech is you know, not very long. You might want to watch it. You might not. I have an annual watching it with a girlfriend, which just shows what total policy nerds the two of us are. Um, but we often throw things at the television when when they annoy us. So, uh, but review the budget speech just for the key announceables. You know, if you're doing an overview to a board um, as part of the budget papers, it will have quite a lot of those top line pieces in it that you can actually just say, okay, so the government's assumptions are that inflation will be this, employment will be this, and so forth. There is a budget overview. Um, it's usually about six to ten pages. It's on the Treasury website. It's a really top line themes and intentions, but the really big announceables are always in there. It's really easy to find. Budget paper num number one, again, that's really that priority, the top line financials, how much money is coming in, how much is going out, the, the, the financial assumptions. Budget paper, question mark, question mark, um, performance and well-being. There's going to be quite a lot of detail in that one. I think that's going to be a really important paper on what the government's priorities were. So last year's budget was very much, we're here, we're going to you know, stabilise the, the economy and the system and we're going to go forward in a sustainable manner. Budget paper um, performance and well-being is highly likely to have a lot of that priorities of how the government expects to do that and the government, the focus they're going to put on it. It will include some new programs and dollars allocated to those. And also, as I said before, those expected outcomes, and they're really important if you're you know, in the organisations that you work in, if the government says our expectation is we are going to build X number of houses and our outcome is 100 houses, that's going to tell you their expectations, what scope you're talking about and so forth. It also gives you something in future years to try and hold them to account for. Budget paper, the budget paper that's currently number two, the agency statements, that will have that detail in it as well. So you need to look at both of those papers, I would assume and expect in quite a de degree of detail. And then budget number three, particularly if you've got a, a, an interest in infrastructure or local government um, and some of the machinery of government change will be in there. In terms of how you use this information, it's really important to build a picture about what's being announced and then check it against what's been announced before. One of the, the, the pitfalls, and I'll come back to those, but I always say that this, you know, is this actually new spending? You know, governments are remarkably effective, as I'm sure many of you experienced before, at announcing something like it's new when actually they're really announcing something that they announced six months ago and they're either presenting it as new or they're confirming now that they really are spending it. So actually just check before you get too excited about the new spending, is it actually new spending? Check spending areas in the, you know, in the portfolio, in the agency um, statements, 
have funding numbers gone up? Has Have they gone down? Has funding just disappeared? Because it can. So actually check those. Have there been changes in those estimates or in the forecast or in the reporting of that? So the new framework's obviously going to be a change in how they report. But are there actually changes in what they're estimating to spend in future years? Last year, they say they'd spend $100 million this year, and this year they're saying they're going to spend 50. What does that? What is that actually happening? What's happening? Has money gone down? Is the intent to spend more? And then compare all of the information you found in the budget papers to what you've seen in the budget media releases on the issue that you're talking about and any other statements or fact sheets from the, the, the minister that you find on their website. So pitfalls, things to watch out for. Um, I'm getting older and much more cynical about budgets, I'm afraid. So, um, you know, governments are re getting really, really good at announcing money that they've already announced. Um, you know, here we're going to spend this. Um, they already told you that six months ago, or you know, they've they've been you know, they're just re-announcing money that's already been announced. Government's hiding changes to the budget, so literally not announcing something, but you notice that something that was in the paper last in, in the budget papers last year is no longer there. Um, that's becoming more common too. So do check those things. Um, changing reporting frameworks is a classic one, and obviously you've got to change in reporting um, frameworks. Because this is a new paper, you can't compare it to last year's paper or the paper the year before. Um, you know, if they're refining those indicators for performance and well-being, unfortunately you're not going to be able to completely compare next year's one with this year's one if they're going to change between now and then. So just be aware of that when you're reading the papers and just double check everything you're reading just to make sure that you you really are getting the right sense of it. Machinery of government changes I've already mentioned, um, they can be quite panicking sometimes if you can't find something that you're expecting to find and it is actually there, it's just moved to a different department or a different part of the budget papers. Um, and then there's governments not spending money that they've announced. So, you know, they've said they're going to spend money and then they don't spend it. So the budget is a way of checking if that money's been spent. Um, the other key pitfall is not a government pitfall, it's a it's a human pitfall, and it's actually not checking carefully. Um, control F is a really useful tool. Um, as I said here, the, your best friend when reading budget papers. Write your um, words, phrases, things you're looking for you know, before the budget, and then literally before you send out your update or your board paper or your media releases, actually check all of your key phrases and, and words through the budget papers just using control F. Um, it's amazing some of the things you find sometimes doing that. And it also does mean that you have found all of the, the references to, for example, homelessness or housing, et cetera. Um, I really can't recommend that stronger. It's a really simple tool and it's very easy to forget. So how can you then check? You've done all of this work. I've been nasty and told you the pitfalls and, and, and where to be careful. How can you actually check that you got things wrong? Well, recheck the budget papers by term, check your key phrases and so forth. Don't be ashamed or you know embarrassed to look at other sources of information. I mean, read other peak bodies or um, accounts of the, the, the newspaper of the budget read analyst accounts, um, look at the newspapers, um, things that people are writing. I, I found it really funny. I was listening to a journalist talk about um, budget night the other day and thought it really, really entertaining was that you know, this is somebody who had been to budget probably every year for the last 20 years and was still worried that they'd missed something and had they actually read the papers properly. So don't expect to be an an expert just expect to be organized and looking at other people's information is a really good way of just checking whether you've seen something that they haven't or they've seen something you haven't the other thing to do is actually call and ask obviously you can't necessarily do that on budget night but in the days after budget ring colleagues that other. i've seen this in the budget papers i think it means this do you know about that Ring the relevant department. They are actually, you know, we do pay their wages. They are there to help us, you know, they're supposed to be. Um, ring and ask. 
Um, you know, I have a very dear client who works in, in childhood um, rare diseases who actually rang the department the morning after the federal budget recently and said, I'm really sorry, but you know, we were told that we might get some money for X. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, you did. It's just we didn't put it where you think you're going to find it. It's actually captured with a whole group of other funding. So just to be aware of that and don't be ashamed to ring and ask because, you know, as I said, budget papers can be complicated. And while you can prepare, um, if you're really unsure, ring somebody and, and check with them. Um, as I said, there's some really useful websites out there. That's just the Treasury, the standard Treasury one. That's got the budget process. It's got all of the budget papers, so all of the you know, one to fours that I've mentioned before. There's also the Budget New South Wales, the, the budget um, website itself. So there's two places to find these documents. There's the media releases. Um, I've just put up um, the Department of Community Communities and Justice, their website in terms of, you know, where all their media pieces are. But every single department has one of those. And so if you're interested in one that's that's different, say, education, just go and look at their news and media section or go to their homepage on budget day or after the budget. Budgets, they usually have a budget section right up front on the website to let you know what you're looking at and all of those documents will be together. So in terms of that's you know, me in terms of telling you all about everything, um, you know, I'm really happy to take questions. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen. But I'm really happy to take questions. I hope I didn't go through that too quickly for people. Um, but just ask anything. Um, Does anyone um, yeah. have any questions to jump in with? Oh, I, mean, yeah, I have, I yes. Can... First, if you can elaborate about the federal budget and the state budget, like what is the balance there? How does it actually really work? Because I reckon most of the money coming from the federal government. Yeah, and in, if that's the case in your sector, then the New South Wales budget might be of less interest to you. But it's still it's still valuable to look at the budget in New South Wales to see what the government is doing around your area and around your sector to see what their priorities are and what they're they're likely to look at. And it is interesting. I think the federal government budget is. It certainly impacts what's happening in states more and more. Um, but state government budgets are very important, particularly in social services, because the state government is actually delivery of services. So while, while some of the money might come from the states, from the federal government, a lot of it's then allocated by the state governments. I don't underestimate the state. It's just like, what is the proportion money-wise? How much is the overall federal budget and how much is the state budget? I could not tell you that off the top of my I, I, I'm happy to take that offline and look it up for you, but I could not tell you off the top of my head. Thank you. Thanks, Samir, and thanks, Catherine. Um, Frankie, you had a question? Uh, hi, Catherine. Uh, sorry, I haven't done my research for this question, so it might easily be answered if I had looked. But they used to do um, Indigenous reporting document i don't think it came out at budget time but it was sort of allied with those papers are they still doing that there so i saw one at the half year but i haven't seen one recently um to be frank with you and they haven't done one aligned with budget that i can remember it's usually a different paper and I I don't really understand why I mean I'm from Victoria and we have a much smaller Indigenous population um, than New South Wales I've never understood why New South Wales doesn't put one out at budget time um, and I'm going to say that for two reasons I mean a I think it's the right time to put it out but if it was really awful you'd also be able to hide it by some of the other things so going back to my cynical comments earlier um, I actually think it's something that they should report on budget I am um, as I said, I haven't seen it one for a while, though. That's a really yeah. good point. Yeah, I think well, the last one I saw was uh, the Liberal Party's one. Yeah. From maybe 2022, I think it was. And hopefully they might capture that, though, in some of the performance and, and, and wellbeing measures. Because, I mean, for me, that would be a, an obvious key indicator in your state 
of if you're going to report against the well-being of your community, how well um, Indigenous communities' measurements are tracking should actually fall within that. So hopefully you might find something in that budget, that new budget paper. In addition to that, that uh, diagram you showed of somebody else's well-being budget and they had inequality measures, do you think it's likely that our government will include inequality measures? They should. Inequality measures and gaps are an essential part of a wellbeing framework. So you're of, you're, and it's one of the reasons I think New Zealand was very keen to adopt one because they were trying to track those in, in inequality and inequity issues. Um, yeah, I, I I have my fingers crossed for that, but I guess we'll see, Francesca. Thanks, Catherine. Any other questions for Catherine? Yes, I have. Sorry. <laughs> uh, which uh, state, uh, New South Wales, should look up, like Victoria? Who is doing better? And maybe this is a way to push our own politician here. Tell them, okay, look at Victoria. They are doing good. Or whomever. Or Queensland, whatever. You, you, um, you certainly wouldn't look at Victoria. You really, really okay. would not look at Victoria. Who is um, the best? Who is number one? Um, or maybe we are, unfortunately. You, 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 I was about to say, you're actually doing very well at, from an economic perspective. Um, you continue to track. So you're, you're carrying less debt than most of us. So okay. one of the problems most of us are having is the fact that our, you know, don't get me wrong, New South Wales debt is high and interest rates are hitting it. And you've got this problem with the GST, which means that you your interest payments will go up, but your debt to state revenue is nowhere near Victoria's. Um, you know, I, I live in a I live in a place that I'm pleased I'm not raising children in, to be frank. Sorry, that's a really cheerful comment. Um, but I haven't looked at Queensland for a while, though, also Amir, so I can't really give you a good comparison about Queensland or WA because I I have not looked at their budgets with any degree of rigour in quite some time. Um, Catherine, just following on from Amir's question, I'm interested because something that we've, we've noticed at NCOS and, and I know that a number of our colleagues in the sector have noticed as well is just how, um, just the lack of transparency in the budget papers just been getting worse and worse and worse with each year to the point where I, I wasn't around for the budget process last year, but my colleagues tell me it, they were the worst of all of them. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm interested, <clears throat> I'm interested to get your observations on how that has potentially changed in the last sort of five to 10 years. And also a big question around which state is doing better. Like are there other states or jurisdictions that are actually doing much better in terms of their budget reporting as opposed to their kind of economic um, state? So I think I think you're right. I think, you know, as I said, I was being quite cynical earlier, but I do think it's true. I think governments are hiding more in the budget papers than they used to. I think the public service is letting them do this. I think it's extraordinarily bad practice and I think it's really wrong for us as the taxpayer. Um, you know, this is not government's money that they're spending, it's our money that they're spending and they're telling us less and less about how they're doing that. So I, I, I share that. I think last year was particularly difficult in New South Wales, though, to be fair. I mean, you'd had a change of government. You had a budget cycle that wasn't the normal budget cycle. So you hadn't had people working. You hadn't had the same people working on it. Those first budgets are really, you know, I've been involved in a couple, and they're really nasty for the people who are doing them, not just the people who are reading them. I do hope, and as I said, this is a hope, I hope that the whole idea of establishing new performance and well-being measures and indicators is that you will at least get a degree of consistency about reporting to the same things year in year. So I think, you know, in the past, the coalition government in New South Wales had that old outcome statement, which was by no means perfect, but it did allow comparisons to be made year by year. And I'm hoping that this is what this was going back to. It's going back to, back to a 
an improved version of that. Um, fundamentally, I would say governments that have been in longer, as a general rule, the budget papers tend to be easier to read, partly because of that, um, partly because of that, that capacity to compare year and year and the fact that you, there are some things you simply have to report on. So you have to report on how much money is spent. You've got to report on, you know, there's some legal requirements about what has to be in the budget. I think all governments are getting much worse, though, in, you know, as, as I mentioned before, in relation to the, the, the federal budget recently, getting into budgets and not telling anybody what they're there for, basically to allow the minister some freedom. Um, but sometimes they have actually allocated that money. So there is a pot of money in, there was a pot of money in last year's budget, which I knew the four groups who were going to get that money probably about four months before it was announced. But that money had been allocated. That money was going to go to those four groups. It appeared in the budget line just as one chunk of cash. And a lot of people spent a lot of time trying to work out who, who was going to get it, how did you get your hands on it, what was the process for for um, giving that out to groups when fundamentally that decision had been made well before those budget papers were printed. And that type of thing I think is getting more common and I don't think any government is innocent of it. Thanks, um, Catherine. But, yes, the, the longer a government's in, as a general rule, the easier it is to read or interpret the budget papers. So I think you're in a bit of a transition still in New South Wales. You've got a new you got a new framework coming, and you've you had a, a framework last year that really was undercooked. Is the nicest thing I can say about it. <laughs> Over to you, Frankie. Uh, before I ask yet another question, is there anyone else that was wanting to ask one? Uh, okay. Um. So just uh, in terms of budget rumours, um, yes. so we heard a rumour that a particular department, their budget bid was looking good, and then last week or the week before it all got slashed. Um, so would that have been the budget cabinet that made that decision? It might, it might even have been the expenditure review committee meetings because they can get quite heated and quite, you know, ministers literally turn up to expenditure review committee. So say I'm I'm not on expenditure review committee and I'm the minister for you know, legal affairs, I literally rock up to, but to ERC and I present to my colleagues what I want them to spend money on. And it's basically um, some ministers are very, very, very good at this. Some ministers are very, very bad at it and you know how well your minister performs in that room can completely change what the department gets um and it is really it's a I, hes I hesitate to call it a battle between colleagues but everybody is competing for the same money mm. you know, the money is not endless do how good you are at making your case that your department needs x for y versus another one of your colleagues who's arguing that his department needs A for B, there's a whole heap of need, value, ethics, and then there's a whole group of politics just sitting right in the middle of those arguments of how well somebody argues against somebody. I mean, and things change right up until the very last minute. I, I was involved many years ago with a piece in, in federal government that I was living in London and I got a phone call from a cabinet minister asking me whether I had evidence of a particular thing he wanted to get through cabinet and I through ERC. And I was like, you're never going to get that up. And he said, send me your slides. And I sent him my old slides for something that I'd proposed, my company had proposed to government genuinely eight years earlier. And at the very last minute, he got that through ERC. Wow. And I still don't understand how he did that, but it happens all the time. So, yes, a minister might lose, another minister might win. Um, you know, the day after the budget, you, you always see, you know, in the newspapers, the budget winners and losers. Um, as a former staff member, we used to kind of do the same rating, but on the ministers, like which minister did, did well out of the budget and which one didn't. <laughs> Um, because actually there is a degree of that. And I know it sounds ghastly, but it is actually, it is how the process works. You are presenting your vision 
for your department against one of your other colleagues who's presenting his vision for his department and the expenditure review committee makes that decision and sometimes cabinet might over over overrule them but that happens less and less in my of my observation so it's really about the the ERCs ERC so, is very yeah. the most powerful body in government right. even more powerful okay. I would argue than cabinet oh, okay. and their only job is the budget okay that's all they they also do a degree of tracking spend expenditure but basically there's usually five of them and they basically run the whole budget process. Do we know who they are? Um, I should have checked. That's my bad. Um, I apologise. So the Premier, the Treasurer, the Minister for Finance, um, and then there's usually two others. It's a pretty small group. I, I can check, though. Um, and I don't act. it used to be public in New South Wales. I assume it still is. Thanks, Catherine. No trouble. Are there any but other yes. questions for Catherine? Um, one last question from me, Catherine, is the um on one of the slides you had the the kind of the timeline of the budgetary process. From a pre-budget perspective, for those of us online who do pre-budget submissions, at what point, I mean, obviously the government always calls for pre-budget submissions from stakeholders, but they're calling for it up until sort of the start of March or something, the year off. So in your view, what is actually the, the prime time that we should be getting our pre-budget submissions into actually properly feed into that budgetary process? Okay, so you should be aiming to get your pre-budget submissions in in time to get into the portfolio budget submission. So I'm just going to pull that slide up, sorry. So if you look at that slide, you've got portfolio budget submissions going in in early March. You want to be in an ideal world, and it won't always happen, don't get me wrong. Um, in an ideal world, you want to be part of that. So I would say you want to get in there. I always argue you want to be really arguing very strongly six months out of a budget of what you want to see in one. So it's sort of like December, so, January. I was about to say December, January. So for federal, you know, federal's, you know, they they the federal department comes out calling for um often calling for um budget pre-budget submissions in January. And I'm like, it's too late. So basically I would go three months pretty much before. So if I was you, I'd be going December, January. And, and you don't need to have it written. What I would say is by that point you want to be socialising what you want with people. You want to be getting that feedback, writing it, getting it to the department, so getting it to your department people well before it goes through into the Treasury process. Because Treasury won't look at it till later, whereas the department you're working with is looking for ideas to put into their portfolio budget um, submission. So they actually need to write a pre-budget submission of their own, essentially. If you can get your idea into that, you're ahead of the game. And what do those portfolio budget submissions actually look like? Like, do you, do you know sort of how they're generally, do they follow a general structure or template or? So... Generally, they are, we, you know, so they'll basically say, we want, we want to do this. So usually this is the vision. This is what we want to achieve. We're going to do that by doing this and this and this and spending this and this. These are the things we need to continue to, to, to spend um, on our programs. Here's our new things. These are the new things we want to spend money on. And then if there are any, it's the offsets. So what are we going to give up? So one of the other things I think that you should all be doing is always keeping an eye out for any programs that or initiatives that you don't think work very well and suggesting governments get rid of them and repurpose the money into something else. Because if, if there's genuinely something that you don't think works well, say so. And are you so, saying sort of within the same portfolio or, or are you saying yeah. we could be saying let's get rid of this, you know, piece of infrastructure that, you know, nobody needs and, you know, 
move it into something else yeah. or it's you could say that it's much more effective for the minister and the department you're working with if you do it within the same department because then it's an automatic there's more they have more control right so you you can actually say they're not arguing that they need more money from somebody else's department they're actually saying what we'd like to do is we'd re re like to repurpose money we've already got they're also you know they're governments Governments, as a general rule, don't like that this is the other issue. The longer a government is in power, the harder it becomes to get them to kill an old project because, of course, somebody, one of them actually invented it. Um, I, I often think this is when it, you need to change a government. I'll be very honest about my experiences in 2005 in working at federal level before I went to London where I started getting really, really frustrated about the fact that you go to somebody and say, this is a really rubbish program. It's no longer necessary. It's been going for eight years and you should can it. And they'd be like, no, 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 we invented that. It's like, yeah, well, you, you need to move on. <laughs> you need to move on and we need a new government who will then kill it because they know it's not working. But it, if it's somebody's legacy program, it can be they can be hard to move. Um, and sure enough, in that early part of the, the, the Rudd-Gillard years, you saw a lot of government programs that had been around for a while go. So I think you're in a position at the moment still with this government that if you've got a program that's longer than them, which is most of them, that you think is not performing or delivering the outcome, A, suggest getting rid of it, or B, suggest when they do the consultation of putting a measure against it in that new you know, framework of performance and wellbeing, Put a measure against it that it will fail against, so it should. So you then have evidence of why it should got, be got rid of. Thank you, um, Frankie. Uh, good. Do we have access to those portfolio budget submissions? No. No, they're cabinet documents. Okay. So ERC is a committee of the cabinet, and therefore they are cabinet documents. So yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was a staffer and I looked after my ministers, my part of my job was actually managing my minister's cabinet documents. Um, he and I would have been almost the only people in the office who got to see all of them. Yeah, and if you're not on ERC, if you're not on ERC, you don't get to see everybody else's either sometimes. So often ERC members are the only people who see all of them. Not always, but, you know, they're very tightly held. Dean. Yes, thanks. Um, Catherine, you were speaking about um, the uh, submissions and um, I just wondered, is it, what do they look for when it comes to something that will really grab their attention and, you know, see it as a priority or is it the evidence or is it, um, you know, how, how, what would be a good way of making ours pop as it were? Yeah, um, so there's probably two things I'd say about this. Um, evidence is really critical. Um, I run a business that creates evidence because most government departments don't anymore. Um, and they've really sort of thrown quite a lot of that evidence making and creation and e economic evaluation out to groups like yours and companies and other service providers when often once upon a time they did this themselves. I mean, the Federal Department of Health has only just appointed a, a reappointed a chief economist after not having had one for like, I think it's eight or nine years. You know, they just stopped doing a whole heap of what I would term their own work, um, which has been lovely for me, but I think it's really wrong from an ethical and, and principal position. Um, so evidence does matter because they are looking for evidence constantly at the same time as producing less of it themselves. Um, I've obviously made my views on that known. The other thing to make things pop is actually be aware of what you think your minister is looking for and what the department's looking for. So, you know, you have those depart discussions with people in the department and actually don't be afraid to ask, if, you know, what do you think, you know, what, what are your priorities at the moment? What are you wanting to see? Um, making notes in meetings with them about the things that make their eyes light up and actually using their language to frame your requests. 
because it, it makes it easier for them to think it was their idea if you're using their language. I think language is really mirroring your audience's language is a way of building compassion, connection, and actually making them take notice. So I would really say that they're some of the things of actually knowing your audience well and playing to the things that they want helps make your stuff pop. So, you know, play, playing to their needs and providing evidence, evidence that you can provide that what you're suggesting is proven to work or has had good outcomes elsewhere or will drive X behaviour, that sort of material is really increasingly important. And as I said, increasingly important in a world where most departments don't do it anymore or don't do it well. What about, um, what about uh, public support for what you're saying? Like, you know, like with housing, there's some surveys showing that there's a huge amount of public yeah. support for diverting funding from like negative gearing to building social housing. Yeah. And, and so I'd put that in the evidence in the evidence yeah. bucket. So your evidence might be public sentiment. It might be economic evaluation. It might be the results of one of your own programs that you know how it ran and you you modelled it, et cetera. All of that is really important. Um, hard facts and figures, whether they're from a survey, et cetera, um, fit in the evidence bucket. The other thing that's also really helpful, which I'm sure you all know, you know, who does your minister listen to? Um, you know, which of his colleagues are important? Who building building that network around your submission of somebody who's not you, who will go in and say this is a good idea and you should fund it. And that might be, depending on where you are, it might be the local MP for where you are. It might be the backbench committee who's look who who deal with the issue from a parliamentary perspective. You know. All of those those things, having those other voices to surround sound you, if you can get it, is great. So the more submissions and committees and hearings and whatever that we do over the year, the better, sort of. I, I think it's the more, I don't think it's always, I don't think it's always more, it's actually best targeted. So, you know, you might only do one, but you've got all the right people in the right room at the right time and they then go off and do the right thing because of it. That's more effective than having five that don't have the right people, if that makes sense. Yeah. So if you only produce one really outstanding survey or evidence or report a year, but it drives the right outcome, that's a better outcome than doing five that don't hit the audience. Emma? Hi, just leaning on from that answer you gave to Frankie then, um, I'm one of the two lived experience um, advocates and advisors sitting in on this meeting at the moment. So I guess um, I was curious about your experience about the role of lived experience ambassadors or advisors in, in these sort of meetings. Like what kind of weight do we hold if we turn up to a meeting or if there's or if there's a um, you know a case study or a personal um, story from one of us going along with these submissions, I'm just curious to, um, about your experience with that. Thank you. Case case studies and people are. Um, I write a lot of reports, and I very rarely don't write one for without a case study of a human in it, because of the mm -hmm. fact that actually. You're always trying to get the hook. So if if how I would think of it as you're in front of somebody, if you're having a meeting, you're only going to have that person for 15, 25 minutes. What's going to make them remember you tomorrow? And the problem is, is that we don't know because often we've not met that person before. We can do all the research we want, but we don't know what hooks them. But one of the things I would say after years of experience is that they'll remember the story of X or the one piece of evidence that they went, oh, my gosh. So I'm working on something at the moment and the federal government is being really, really unreasonable about a particular, they suggested that somebody do something and they gave a number and 
then they came back and trebled the number. Now, every single person I've told this story to remembers the trebling of the, uh, the number because they think it's unreasonable. Yes. It's that what's going to make somebody remember this tomorrow is different for each individual, but trying to find that is what makes you be the people who gets remembered. It's the person, it's the reason you get your follow up. And for a lot of people, that is the, and it might not be your whole story either. I mean, I'm quite fascinated about some of the things that people remember. They actually might remember the throwaway line you made about something that didn't work. You know, your main story mm. might actually be I couldn't do X and you mentioned that actually, you know, you couldn't push the tram button and they remember that you couldn't push the tram button, not the actual full story. So I think yes, those pieces are really important because we are trying to capture our audiences and we're trying to capture their hearts and minds. What's the hook? Mm. Is it that something's unreasonable? Yeah. Is it unfair? Is it the fact that you're wasting money and you could buy this instead of this with the same money um is it the fact you know for years we've you know um in in health for years there's always been the story of how many parents go into a pharmacy during winter and to have a conversation with the pharmacist about which of their three children they can afford to buy the medicine for because they can't afford to buy it for all three who's worse off you know and that's something that's you know been around a long time but people remember those types of things so I, mm. I think the lived experience is really important, particularly when people have no idea often what the lived experience is. Mm. Yeah, great. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Catherine from those on the line? No? Well, I, I'm oh, just curious sorry. about the separation of power. So I have just like a question as an example. Any chance that the, the state government, New South Wales, will have the power to subsidize milk, which I love milk? Or it's a matter of federal. Or the state have the power, yeah, instead of for uh, whatever, let's make it 250 or whatever. Just, I'm just yeah. curious. Yeah, the state can, the state can do that, yes. Okay. This is the gear. People, the state governments can do have a very wide ranging capacity to do a lot of things. <laughs> it's a matter often of whether they want to or can afford to. <laughs> well, I've got a question, but I haven't quite formulated it in my head yet. <laughs> Are we meant to be finishing now, Elise? Well, only if there's no, we've got we've got time, but I, I, I won't keep Catherine here unless there are more questions. Um, but if you go ahead, if you had a question, Frankie. Yeah, I've got to I've got to work out what I'm asking. <laughs> it's, not, it's not happening in my brain. Sorry, everyone. Don't worry. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll come back to that another time. You could, all, I'm sure, um, Catherine would be happy for you yeah. to send directly send your yeah. question through to her as well. Definitely, and yeah, and if you do have questions, you know, afterwards that you think oh, I should have asked that, do just you yeah. know, Elise has got my email and can give it to you. That's no trouble at all. Great, right. thanks, Catherine. No, I it's have... it's really important. Budgets are tough, and governments are tough, and you know, I've spent my now I look back at it, I've spent my entire adult life trying to convince governments to do things and, you know, how that works changes sometimes, but there are still those fundamental pieces of actually making things real to people, yeah. I did have one final question, um, Catherine, before we let you go a bit early. Uh, it's more, a, and this might be a silly question because the answer could just be online, but where did you get your sort of intel around or insight around the, what the performance and wellbeing framework could look like in this year's budget? Treasury put out a press release about it. Ah, okay. There you go. <laughs> so Treasury, so... I, I could have looked it up. <laughs> I could have, no, no, I could actually be wrong about that. The, somebody in the department gave a speech about it and it was reported 
And then I did go looking for it when I was preparing for this because I was like, I knew I'd seen something about it. So I actually just basically went looking for what's changed since last year. What are they? They they'd kind of hinted last year that they were going to do something like this. What was it going to look like? I was actually pleasantly surprised that there was more available about it than I thought there might be because I had visions of coming to, to you guys and going, yeah, so they're going to do this thing and we really don't know what it's going to look like. And I could... I probably would have given not a dissimilar to what I have given you. Um, and as I said, for the structure of that, that is very much some of the, how I think they'll structure that in terms of the support to families and the essential services. Some of that is my assumption about the, how they'll do that. But based on what they said their focus was last year, based on the fact of the economy now, I'd expect it to look something like that. But certainly what their aims and objectives in doing it and the fact that they plan to do a consultation before refining it for next year's budget, they have actually confirmed that. So, yeah, it can be interesting sometimes. Sometimes when you go looking for government information, you find more than you think you're going to and other times you find far less. <laughs> Frankie, in that time, did you manage to sort of form... No, I've actually no, forgotten yeah. what it was I was going to ask about. And then, like, first I was struggling to articulate it and then it's just completely gone <laughs> from my mind. <laughs> Who knows? That's okay. Actually, in the process, I did think of another question, which is a little bit out of left field. But um, so every year, NCOS, after following the, the budget, we do a post-budget breakfast and we invite the treasurer to come and address the sector, which we're doing again this year. Um, so we've got our post-budget breakfast on the 25th of June. The treasurer is going to be there. If it was your event, Catherine, and you were there, what are the sorts of questions you would be asking the treasurer? I would actually ask some of those questions about relative decision-making. You know, how do you make a decision that somebody's X, depending on what the budget says, is more important than somebody's housing stability? Um, I'd ask, you know, how how do you, Treasurer, make that decision? How does ERC make that decision? And actually see if he'll tell you how they made one because he might, you know. Um, the other question I think is always a really good one to ask Treasurers, and I'm, you know, actually this budget is based on a whole variety of things. The economy is in a very odd place, et cetera. What keeps you from sleeping at night in relation to it? People can be surprisingly honest when you ask that question. I'm often quite shocked about how honest some people are about what keeps them up at night. You know, is it employment in the CBD? Is it, you know, is it people, you know, not having houses? Is it the fact that, you know, interest payments are going to double? You know, what, almost what are his priorities? But I always think questions about relative spending, you know, I used to sit on the board of Victoria Legal Aid and we I sat there at, there at a time where we had some really horrible economic situations that we had to deal with in terms of, of balancing or balancing the budget, not going broke basically. And we actually had to cut funding to a whole variety of people who desperately and very much deserved our support. Um, and actually asking people how they reach that decision is actually really important because often and often people are attacked for the decision, but nobody asks them how they, you know, I had I had various people, you know, who would walk up to me on the street and literally attack us. We were in the newspapers for doing dreadful things. People would come up and attack you. Very few people ever said, how did you actually make that decision? And that's a really good insight into how somebody thinks, what they value how they work as a team, because it's not just a single decision maker. It's a it it's a really useful thing to have an insight into. Can you or, and also me? which bit did you hate? Which 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 bit of it did you hate most? Like, you know, in terms of, you know, I always think back to the first coalition federal government in um sorry, first budget of the coalition government back in 2013-ish. Every single person I know has something in that budget that they still hate. And actually it's a really good indicator of who you are, which bit you hate most. Sorry, Frankie, I cut you off. Um, I was just going to ask, can you sort of put them on the spot and say something like, 
Look, we know the Minister for Housing and your senior bureaucrats would be behind doing X, but it's not in the budget. Why not? Can you explain your decision not to include it? Yep, definitely. Okay. Yep. You know, politicians are out there. I mean, the one thing I always say, and I'm 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 quite brutal about this and I, I don't resile from it at all. Your money pays that man's salary. His job is to answer your questions. Yeah. His job is to do the best he can do for all of the people who pay his salary and who he represents. Yeah. Yeah. Ask him what you like. Just go for yeah. it. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. It, well, yeah. <laughs> obviously you've got to play a bit of that strategic political game you know, so you do but you can also take your junior staff member and just go I'm new and I just don't understand <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know that's it it then doesn't reflect on your organization and so forth and like I've I've been that junior staff member and sometimes you just I was blonde back then too so just being very nasty about the old blonde jokes I used to get at that age <laughs> Okay, so we should get Daniel to ask our questions. <laughs> but it's, it's you know, I do think it's important for, and, and this goes back to, um, this goes back to Emma's comp question about the lived person and so forth. Whenever I am actually getting patients and other people to go and talk to their local MPs, I always say, just remember, this person actually chooses to do this job to represent you. Nobody forced them to do this. And actually, it is their job to listen to you. It's not like they're not doing you a favour by meeting you. That is their job. Um, luckily, most people who go and visit an MP usually want to go and visit a whole heap more, which is always a lovely story that they discover that they're not all you know people with horns and, and tails. Most of them are actually trying to do their best. Um, but that's why I think you need to ask those questions because you actually need to understand how they think this is their best. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you so Not much for that, Catherine. Um, are there any last questions before we wrap up for this session? No. So thank you again, Catherine, for another fantastic um, learning session on the budget process and also fielding all the additional questions around pre-budget submission and advocating and influencing government. It's been really, really helpful and a really wide ranging discussion. I'm sure we all found really, really valuable. Um, so really appreciate, uh, appreciate it. Appreciate everyone online who joined today. Thank you for the conversation. And I'm sure we'll see you around about this time next year again, Catherine. Fantastic. No, well, thank you for the opportunity. I really like, you know, I believe very much in all of the, the hard work that you and your sector does and actually anything I can do to help you on that one, um, always there. So, you know, good and good luck with your budget. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Very much. Have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. Bye.